Hello, and welcome to the August Oncology Coding Break. My name is Heather Donahue, and once again, Melissa Matter will be joining us today for Female Reproductive System Part 2, Uterus and Fallopian Tube Anatomy and Staging Guidance. And as a reminder, this is a four-part series, so if you did miss Part 1 in July on Ovary Anatomy and Staging Guidance, you can head over to our YouTube channel to check that out. Today's coding break will briefly discuss the fallopian tube anatomy. As a reminder, the fallopian tube and ovary are classified together for staging purposes, so you can refer back to part one for fallopian tube staging, which is the same as ovary. Melissa will also walk us through the anatomy of the uterus, briefly discussing what happens when normal antegrade flow from the uterus into the vagina becomes retrograde and flows from the uterus up through the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneum. She'll discuss the lymph nodes that are regional to the uterus, which do differ slightly than what we did learn were regional to the ovary. Next, Melissa will define anexa for us, which thank goodness, I know I needed this. Um, this is usually a source of confusion and can be difficult to determine when you do or don't have anexal involvement, so she'll go over that. And then after uh, Melissa wraps up, I will discuss AJCC and SEER summary staging and highlight exceptions and disagreements between the standard setters. With that, Melissa is going to jump right into staging. This is the standard drawing of the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and vagina. The endometrium, which is C54.1, as shown in the histology side, is epithelial tissue. And as you can see, that's lighter in color than the myometrium, which is smooth muscle and which is found um, just to the right of that endometrium. So the myometrium, that is the smooth muscle, which is going to be C54.2. Then there's going to be the parametrium, which is the outer connective tissue membrane. The fundus is the dome above where the fallopian tubes enters. And so when you look at that, there's the fallopian tubes entering. So this part up here is going to be the fundus. The ovaries are attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. The ovaries are not attached to the fallopian tubes. Instead, there is a small amount of space there. The fallopian tubes are lined with epithelial tissue. It's very similar to what's going to be in the uterus. Now, menstrual flow is supposed to be anti-grade, leaving the vagina. But sometimes it's going to be retrograde. So it's supposed to be anti-grade going out through the vagina, but sometimes it can be retrograde. And so it's going to go backwards and come out through this opening between the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And so then that tissue can land on the ovaries, it can land on the uterus, or also um, the bladder, uterus, and other organs. So this is what is thought to happen with endometriosis. The uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries are covered by the broad ligament, which is an extension of the peritoneum. Now, this is the model that we've seen already. And again, it's going to show you the peritoneum that's coming down. And it's going to be covering the bladder, covering the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And then this is going to be called the broad ligament. And also, we're going to have the adnexa. That's a term that we hear a lot about. And so the agnexa is the region adjoining the uterus that contains the ovaries and fallopian tubes and associated vessels, ligaments, and connective tissue. Essentially, anything that is attached to the uterus is going to be considered the agnexa. Now, also in this slide, this is what we've seen before with the sagittal section through the model. And so... Here we have the uterus and coming down to the uh, vagina. And so you can see how close the uterus is to the bladder and also to the rectum. So this is the rectum here. So the rectouterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas, this space right in here, is going to be considered distant for sear if there's going to be some tissue in here. 
Then to look at these lymph nodes again, um, we're going to have, this, if we start at the top of the list, up here are going to be the paraaortic, and then we're going to have the common iliac, the presacral, the external iliacs, the internal iliacs, the obturator is going to be down farther, obturator is in there. Inguinal is going to be considered distant. That's going to be on, on the other side of the, um, the abdominal wall. Then the parametrial are going to be next to, this is going to be the uterus here. And then we're going to have the paracervical down here, which are going to be more next to the cervix. Now, one thing to remember, the blood flow coming mean here, this is going to be that external iliac vein. We're going to have an internal iliac vein, and they come together to form the common iliac vein. And so the lymphatics are going to be going that same direction. And sometimes you'll see that there's a difference between the external iliac and the common. And so as cancer cells break off and they go through these lymphatics, they're going to go through the either the internal or the external iliac first, if they make it all the way up to the common iliac, then they have traveled farther. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Now let's take what we just learned from Melissa and apply it to our staging. So we're going to start here with AJCC. And this table here shows the T categories on the left and the stage group when you have N0, M0 on the right. Interestingly enough, there is no TIS category for AJCC. So from the AJCC 8th edition online staging, endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, or EIC, should be considered an invasive T1 cancer as it's been associated with Metz disease and it is not a, quote, precancerous, unquote, lesion. Up to two-thirds of serous EICs may be associated with extrauterine disease. So for AJCC, if you have an EIC, this should be assigned a T1. Looking at the T1 category, aside from EIC, we have tumors confined to the uterus, and this does include endocervical involvement. T1A is for tumors invading less than one half of the myometrium, so that smooth muscle layer of the uterus that Melissa showed us. T1B tumors is invading one half or more of the myometrium. When there are no nodes or METs involved, you would have a stage 1A or a stage 1B depending on the T value. T2 tumors involve the stromal connective tissue of the cervix, but not beyond the uterus. It's important to note that this does not include endocervical glandular involvement. From AJCC, endocervical keratage is not adequate to establish cervical involvement, so ECC cannot be used to assign a T2. There would need to be something more like visualization using a copal scope or imaging using MRI or tissue biopsy of the cervix to be able to assign that T2 value. So when you have a T2, N0, M0, your stage group will be stage two. Moving on to T3 tumors here, these tumors involve the serosa, adnexa, vagina, and or the parametrium. This can be by direct extension or dis discontinuous extension, or as the manual states, METS disease to these areas. So we have T3A. These tumors invade the serosa of the uterus or the anexa, which to reiterate is the appendages of the uterus, so any structures connecting to the uterus. So you can see here in the image this T3A tumor is involving the uterus, so it involves the endometrium, the myometrium, uh, the serosa, and then the adnexa. So it kind of goes over here into the fallopian tube, and then it goes over into the ovary, so that tumor also is involving um, the ovarian ligament, um, and then the ovary. So this would be T3A, a tumor that involves the serosa, and it involves the adnexa. And then we have T3B tumors. So this tumor involves all layers of the uterus, again, the serosa here too, but also invades into the um, parametrium here. And then you can see uh, part of the tumor is also in the upper part of the vagina. So that would be a T3B tumor. When you have T3A or T3B, N0, M0, your stage group would be stage 
3A or 3B depending on your T value. T4 tumors invade the mucosa of the bladder or the bowel. So there's a great depiction of this in the AJCC manual, so be sure to check that out. When you have T4N0M0 or T4NEN, which does include clinical NX, M0, the stage group will be 4A. Looking at the top right of the slide here, when you have lymph nodes involved, T1 to T3, and the N is N1MI to N1A, the stage group will be 3C1. If you have T1 to T3 and N2MI to N2A, the stage group would be 3C2. The MATS category is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's only M0 and N1. So for M1, this includes distant lymph nodes, such as inguinal nodes. Intraperitoneal disease, this includes intra-abdominal metastasis to abdominal or pelvic peritoneal surfaces or the omentum. And these are definitely areas that are particularly seen uh, with serous and clear cell tumors. So make note of that. It's important to note that M1 excludes METs to the vagina, uterine serosa, or anexa. So as we just discussed, that would be captured in the T category. And lung is a very common site for uh, METs disease for the uterus. One last important note for AJCC staging at the bottom right of the slide says, if surgical pathologic findings are insufficient the clinical CT, CN, or CPM categories should be used on the basis of clinical evaluation. For example, if lymph nodes are not obtained or a lymph node dissection is attempted, but no lymph nodes are found in the specimen, we can use the clinical N to assign pathologic staging. An example would be PT1A on path specimen with no lymph nodes found in the specimen, therefore C. N0, C, M0, and we would be able to assign a stage group 1A based on the C, N0. Okay, moving on to serous summary staging. So take note here, we do have an in situ category, and SEER does consider EIC and SEIC to be in situ. Localized is for tumors confined to the uterus. This includes invasion of the myometrium without invasion of the endocervix, or unknown if there's invasion of the endocervix. And it also includes FIGO stage 1, 1A, or 1B. Regional bidirect extension is for tumors involving the myometrium with involvement of the endocervix. Cervix or endocervical involvement. Vagina, parametrium, or vulva involvement. Uterine serosa involvement. Adnexa, so again, those appendages of the uterus, such as the fallopian tubes, ovary, and ligaments. Visceral peritoneum of the corpus. Parietal serosa of the pelvic wall. Bladder and rectum, other than mucosa involvement. The ureter, malignant cytology, and the peritoneum. Or FIGO stage 2, 3, 3A, and 3B. Regional to the lymph nodes includes paraaortic, iliac, paracervical, parametrial, and sacral nodes. Distant sites include distant lymph nodes, so for example, femoral or inguinal lymph nodes. So Melissa let us know that those inguinal nodes are distant for the uterus. Abdominal structures, including the serosa and other tissues within the abdomen. So for example, the sigmoid colon, small intestine, liver, and the omentum. Intraperitoneal disease, this would include things like the cul-de-sac or the pouch of Douglas, uh, that space between the uterus and the rectum, and the vesico-uterine pouch, so that space between the uterus and the bladder that Melissa pointed out to us. The mucosa of the bladder, bowel, or rectum. The lung and FIGO stage 4, 4A, or 4B. Okay, this is a good slide to make note of and keep handy. So here is our major standard setter disagreement. We have to remember to always, always, always keep standard setter rules separate when assigning staging. So to reiterate, 
AJCC says that EIC and SCIC should be considered a T1 tumor and invasive as they report that up to two thirds of serous EICs may be associated with extra uterine disease. But SEER says EIC and SCIC are in site two and would have a behavior of slash two. That's all we have for you today, but be sure to tune in for part three of this series with cervix and vagina anatomy and staging for September, and then mark your calendars for the live coding break on October 24th, where we'll wrap up the series with GYN grade coding, histologies, treatments, and case scenarios that will test your knowledge on everything you've learned throughout, the, throughout this four-part series. This will be awarded one free category A C E at the end of that webinar. So definitely mark your calendars and plan on attending. We will see you back here in September.